Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. All right, everybody, this is episode 343. In the news this week, not much going on. I'm going to be at Manassas Chapter this Thursday on the 10th. I'm going to be doing a presentation on the Word, uh, which is part two in the Quantum Lecture series. I'll be talking about the Tetragrammaton, and that's going to be again at Manassas Chapter, Royal Arch Masons, number 81 in Manassas, Virginia. Essentially, the presentation is all about the Lost Word, string theory, mythology, uh, and I think it's really exciting. It's a fun presentation. I hope you guys will all come out to join us. We'll be going at about six or seven o'clock, so if you're in the area, you're going to want to contact Manassas Chapter or talk to Worshipful Brother and Excellent High Priest Joe Martinez. Also, I want to take a moment to plug my new book. Worshipful Brother, John Ruark and I co-authored a book called It's Business Time, Adapting a Corporate Path for Freemason. Again, adapting. We have it in print copy. You can get a copy for 15 bucks, or you can grab the Kindle version for $9.99. And you know, I've received some really interesting feedback on the book, and that includes people buying an entire set, not just for their upcoming line officers, but for their grand line officers, which I thought was pretty wild. But anyway, few books on the craft today offer any kind of logistical assistance on the operational lodge or its active officers. So this book aims to offer like a fresh look at the best practices that the world of business has spawned over the last hundred years and to take those same market disrupting techniques and adapt them for use at the lodge level. Just because Freemasonry isn't really inherently a business doesn't mean that we can't as an organization benefit from these industry proven best organizational practices. So it's business time lays out those modern concepts and the relevance to Freemasonry in an easy to understand guide. And that's really what this is. Uh, the work explores and adapts each concept for use across the organization regardless of leadership level. So if utilized appropriately, the concepts can be a powerful force multiplier in enabling lodges to succeed in the modern era. And Greg Knott gave us a great quote about the book. Uh, he said, as someone with an MBA, I've long studied some of the best business practices and how to use these in organizations that I have been associated with. Brothers Johnson and Ruark have assembled some of the most innovative approaches used by successful companies and have illustrated how to adopt these for use in Freemasonry. This book is not about making Freemasonry a business, but rather applying these principles in building a successful lodge. I highly recommend this book to anyone looking for new and innovative ideas. Greg J. Knott, Past Master, St. Joseph Lodge, number 970, Illinois, and a senior contributor to the Midnight Freemasons. So I hope you guys don't mind me taking a minute just to plug the book. Uh, we worked really hard on it, and I'm really proud of it. John and I really care about this stuff. We care about the success of your lodge. That's what this is all about. And uh, we had Brother Jason Richards do our editing. So the book is great. I hope you guys really enjoy it. Check it out. You can find it on my website, wcypodcast.com, or you can go to my author page, amazon.com slash author slash Robert H. Johnson, or you can just go to Amazon and type, it's business time, and then type the word Freemasonry, and it's the number one result. We were actually the number one book in several categories in different days. Uh, we were number one in nonprofit. We were number one in new business management. We were number one in new books for various days. It was really cool. So check it out. And I want to let everybody also know about a great opportunity that you're going to find out about in this week's episode. This week, I've got a great interview with brother Scott Hambrick of Intellectual Linear Progression. Now, he is a, a brother mason out of a TO lodge out in Oklahoma, and he's put together something great, and it is regarding the Great Books program. So if you want to jump the gun, head on over to wcypodcast.com and hover over the support the show and drag down there to the Great Books program, and you can read a little bit about it before we get started. But check out this great interview that we've got with Brother Scott talking about the Fellowcraft degree and its lessons and how we should really be trying to apply these things. All right, everybody, we're back this week, and I've got a special guest on the program, Brother Scott Hambrick. And first of all, I want to just tell Scott, thanks for coming on the program today. Man, it's a delight. I love doing these shows, man. It was a really interesting thing that brought us together. Brother Scott has come together, and he made a really neat 
program. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But Scott, if you don't mind, can you give us your lodge and where you're from? Yeah, I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'm a member of well, my, my home lodge is Owasa Lodge, number 545 in Owasa, Oklahoma, a little suburb outside of Tulsa. And I've been a member since, oh gosh, probably like 1999, after I got out of college and came back to the Tulsa area. I'm from the Tulsa area. I had to find a lodge, man. And so uh, I, I ended up ended up at Owasa Lodge. That's awesome. So if I could ask how you got interested in Freemasonry. Well, my, my dad was a Mason, or is a Mason, and it was always mysterious and interesting to me you know as a result as a result you know he didn't really talk about it a great deal right uh, but i knew that he valued it you know i saw his monitor around you know and i knew that you know he would get dressed up from time to time and go to lodge and it was a special thing i remember that as a kid and, and was interested in it and i got married in 97 to my wife charity and her granddad leroy mckinney was a very very active mason and uh, when i when we after we moved back from uh, our university town to Tulsa, you know, I got involved with Leroy and he got me and got me a petition and uh, got me moving. And uh, we traveled lodges all over Oklahoma and Arkansas. You know, we would jump in his truck and go to lodge twice a week. We did that for several years. You Holy know, cow. Got, wow. We were putting on degrees and, and, and uh, lecturing and, you know, helping out with degree work all over the state. It was a, it was a great time to get to spend with her granddad, you know. That sounds amazing. Did you It was. Did you get involved in a lot of the ritual work? Did you like lectures and stuff or were you primarily like visiting? We did a lot of, of ritual work and and lecture work. You know, we would we would jump in his Ford pickup truck with uh, our buddy Henry and one of my buddy Dustin and uh, go all over the state and we would just run language, you know, go down the highway, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. these different lodges and uh, we gosh, I don't know, I guess we just delighted in doing some of this work that other people could, couldn't do, you know, like the third third section lecture of the EA degree that's really long and arduous and I carried my slide carousel around and and gave that lecture hundreds and hundreds of times you know and we ended up I think all of us ended up with a a certificate you know so we you know we were certified to do teach all the floor work and all of the lecture work as well and uh, it was just a god it was just a great great thing to do you know and got to spend time with those men that you know wouldn't have been able to do otherwise it was a delight. Fantastic. Thank you for your service to the craft in that manner. I mean, that means a lot. And I want to dive in a little bit here. People listening right now, the guys and the, the ladies listening, they might not know why I brought you on it. And I have to say that I invited Scott on the program for one main reason. Again, and, and we'll get to that. He's got a unique perspective on the degrees and kind of how to use them in a practical way. And this is what he's come up with. But we hear often of practical uses for Freemasonry all the time. And we put a lot of emphasis on reading. And you have a little bit of a a knack in talking about the trivium and the quadrivium, right? This kind of brought you to do something unique. So as far as the degrees, what spoke to you in terms of lessons and importance? Gosh, well, there's a lot. There's a lot, of course. I mean, we spent so much time, you know, in that language and with that ritual that, you know, they they all mean a great deal to me. But, uh, you know, the, the the fellow craft degree, which used to be the terminal degree, you know, right? I mean, it's uh, the the master mason degree is the newest of the degrees, I think, or the well, the blue lodge degrees. Correct. It was the terminal degree, and it and it's my favorite. You know, from uh, you know, when I'm in the Oklahoma ritual here, and I don't really know, you know, how how much everyone else's is like ours, but the you know the lecture to mother is fantastic, and and then uh, it's ultimately a call to intellectually improve yourself every day henceforth. And I would go to these r- lodges in rural Oklahoma where there were farmers and mechanics and the guy that owned the local bank and just everybody was there. And a fellow craft degree was calling all of those common people to continue to educate themselves. It was letting them know that their job wasn't done just because they finished whatever schooling they had finished. And uh, the fellow craft degree as a result of that is, is my favorite. And I think that all of these, I mean, it's operative you know, we've got operative and speculative masonry, but the speculative masonry calls us to work just as much as the operative stuff does. Uh, we go and we take our obligations, and then we're given charges. And if the obligations actually mean anything, and if the charges actually mean anything, that we have to do stuff 
Like it's not over when we when they turn the lights on and we all go eat and we go home. It's not over. We still have to do something. And that fellow craft degree calls us to educate ourselves forever. Forever, yeah. And that's what I find is is absolutely and I'll just say ridiculous, right? In terms of how what we do <laughs> is work. We we do this thing where we say, Oh, okay, cool, Master Mason, you're all done now. You don't have to do right. anything. And who says it, that? You know, I mean, this is this is the <laughs> attitude, though, right? Like nobody ever nobody ever says, OK, so before you do this, we need you know, you have weekly assignments for yourself to do for the next, you know, three years to see how we're working on this stuff. Or nobody requires anybody to do like a research paper or read a book or whatever before the next degree. It's just memorize the work, rote memorization. And maybe you're not even internalizing anything. Maybe it's just memorization. You don't even know what you're talking about. But yet that somehow qualifies us to move on to this next phase of Masonic uh, enlightenment, as it were. And I guess I want to ask, in terms of this stuff, like in the Masonic mentality, what is Masonry teaching us today? Like what what's relevant in Masonry today? Is it, are there, are there bits and pieces that you feel are more practical for today's use or more relevant today than ever before or not as relevant? What are your thoughts on that? Well, the fellow craft degree, I think, is more relevant now than perhaps maybe it's ever been. Well, maybe not relevant, but there's more information in it for us that we don't get anywhere else than ever before. You know, the talk about the, the, the liberal arts that is in the, the fellow craft degree, that's not secret knowledge, right? The, the liberal right. arts or the trivium and the quadrivium. And prior to, well, by the way, our, the way we educate people now in our schools is really an experiment that's only been around for maybe 150 or 160, 170 years, something like that, since Horace Mann came back from Prussia and started doing what we call schooling now in Massachusetts. And so it's really an experiment. And, you know, I don't think we really know if it works yet. It says we haven't been doing it long enough. And prior to that experiment, people were educated with the trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And nowadays, we don't hear about that very much. And I think that the fellow craft degree is the first introduction to the to that traditional way of educating men uh, that most people have. It was common knowledge to you know our, our founding fathers and people in the European tradition for I don't know a thousand years or maybe three thousand years. But now it seems like a secret hidden in plain sight, you know. And uh, the fellow craft degree tells us exactly why it's valuable and tells us, well, the bones of how to do it. You still have to go do the work. You still have to go pick up the books. You have to pick up the tools and uh, bust your butt. But it's there for us. And I think that's like an interesting call to action. We, we say to do it. And then, like you said, it's hidden in plain sight because it's kind of like the Netflix effect. We add all these things to our queue, but are we ever really going to get to it? Maybe we're not going to watch it because <laughs> it's sitting there. We, it's, it's readily available. Oh, I get to it when I can. It's always there. It's fine. And like you said, the, this fellow craft, the fellow craft degree, my other friend, Scott Duball, uh, he's our state education office here, here in the state of Illinois for masonry. And uh, he says every once in a while, he'll say, people fail to realize that the fellow craft at a point, com- that degree, what was talked about, comprised all of the knowledge that was known to man, the relevant knowledge. And it's interesting to think about it that way. In other jurisdictions, there's a paragraph on each one, grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, Mm -hmm. geometry, music, and astronomy. Here in Illinois, we mention them all, but we only give one paragraph on geometry. We kind of let the others slide away. And, And I think that's a shame, but let me ask you this. Today, in today's world... Everything we want to know or everything that we do know, we, I don't know if it's something we want to know, but everything that we know is shown to us on the television. We're told about what our opinion should be. Um, like we have to kind of go along with popular opinion. There's not a lot out there. So, I mean, do these skills of understanding the grammar and context and knowing how to argue and do those things even matter anymore? I think they matter more than any than any time in the past. Let's go into what these things are and then relate them back to that question there. So sure. gr- grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So traditionally, those things were taught with some basic tools. So grammar would be taught by teaching a young person Latin. And then uh, the lo- logic would be taught probably with Euclid, right? Some geometry. They learn those proofs. The if-then statements, you know, Robert is a man, all men are mortal, Robert is a mortal, you know. And, and they would, so they would learn logic. And then the rhetoric is when they would probably, well, they would write and speak, And then they would also persuade and or teach somebody else these skills they've already learned. Because when one teaches, two learn, right? Correct. So so that's how it was traditionally taught, but it's uh, it's more general than that. Grammar is really – 
the bones of a subject. So if you're going to learn something new, you need to learn the jargon, you know, the special, the special vocabulary around that, that subject. Uh, and that's the, that's the grammar. So you can kind of start to speak the same language as the people that already know this subject matter that you're delving into. And then the logic is, is when you start to organize your thoughts around the concepts in this new material. And then, of course, still, the rhetoric part is when you either persuade or teach people about what you have learned, because that's when all of those concepts are integrated together. And in the rhetoric part is when we also will often enter into dialectic, where we start to learn what we know based on this kind of questioning and answering method that Socrates embodied for us in the Plato's dialogues. And so learning the grammar, learning how to consciously pick apart new material in this three-step process where we identify the grammar of the material, we uh, organize the material in our head and maybe write about it and then uh, discuss it either maybe internally. We can enter into dialectic internally to some degree or with someone else that we that, that's a, a fair interlocutor like you today. That installs in us an exquisite BS detector. <laughs> right. I mean, that's what critical thinking is, right? We're, we're being critical of these thoughts in front of us. And gosh, if we don't need a BS detector more now than ever before, then I've missed something. Yeah, you know, uh, I was I was reading a, a series of books, uh, Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. Mm -hmm. And if you've never read it, anybody out there, read it, it's a good one, or download the, the radio plays on YouTube or whatever. But there's a scene where there's essentially two worlds that are... They're in talks, right? And one of the men leaves for his home planet and the delegates from the home planet are sitting around talking and they're saying something along the lines of, the guy was here for three days and talked for hours and said absolutely nothing. Right. <laughs> Right. And if we watch, if we sit around today, we can watch politicians, we can watch celebrities, we can watch anybody who's in the public eye who certainly has a position of power stemming from maybe some, uh, some money that's coming their way for something. And so they can never quite take a stance on anything. So they have to walk around everything with their words. And so they never actually make a statement. And we get a lot of writers that way too, especially in the Masonic world. Like people don't want to say what certain things mean you know, for fear of like losing the dollar or whatever it's going to be. And I think it's interesting. You, you, you want to name about some that. names? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think those guys out there probably have a heavy conscience on it. They should know who they are. <laughs> you know what? One of, I think one of the worst things is I think some of these people don't know. I think they don't know who they, I mean, they, they, um, they don't organize their thoughts terribly well. They haven't, you know, internalized their and fully fleshed out their ideas about whatever it is they're talking about, but somehow they've gotten a public forum and they just run their mouth. But there are some people that are deliberately entering into sophistry, right? Right. And that's one of the things that we're taught when we work with the, with the trivium is to identify sophistry. And that's what you're talking about, these people that, that will get up in front of a microphone and put forth their talking points. They will write their blog post and give it the clickbait title. I mean, there's nothing more sophistical, maybe, than the clickbait title of a blog post, right? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's you know, the written word manipulated in such a way to elicit an emotional response from you. And, may, and maybe not convey any meaning. Right. And uh, it's it's the ultimate manipulation. And, and so we, we see it today beware. in social media all the time. It might not even be necessarily words anymore because we're so drawn to sight. And we're so, I'm just going to say, we're lazy in terms of reading anything. We have um, just sight cues. You'll never guess what this picture of this person did or whatever. And there's like half the picture there. It's like, oh, I got to see what this is. And then we read it and it's nothing. It's really... Five secrets about ancient masonry. Yeah. I ran an experiment about two years ago and I pulled some really interesting, I would call, I wouldn't say inflammatory. I don't want to be negative about it. I pulled some kind of shocking things that nobody had really written about publicly that are not secretive. They're, you know, straight out of the... Uh, the Hebrew, it's like a set of Hebrew encyclopedias. And I pulled some of the legend of the third degree out of there and I put it inside this post and I, I titled it, you know, like Uprock style masonry. And basically, you know, it got all the clicks in the world and everybody was even complaining or like nice clickbait article. And I was like, well, <laughs> that's how this works. I got you on the blog. You read some stuff. You're more intelligent now. But the key is, at least I gave you something that you can use. <laughs> so, so did you use rhetoric for good rather than evil there? I tried to, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we can do that, right? Like, we can use sophistry and rhetoric 
to um, persuade a jury to not convict an innocent man, right? So Plato talks about, is it okay to use, well, essentially manipulation and deception for a good end? Yeah. You know, so, so, so when we start to, when we start to really delve into these, these materials, we get to ask ourselves all of the great big questions and wrestle all that stuff, you know, cause there aren't, there aren't any new questions. I don't think I'm certainly not slick enough to come up with any of them. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and so when we, when we start to delve into these materials that people traditionally used when they pursued the trivium, we're confronted with those big questions and those big ideas. So one of the things that drew me to masonry is probably, I don't know, is romance and nostalgia. Yep. I just romanticize and, and idolize Jefferson and, you know, so many of our, you know, our founding fathers. And then later on, later on after I became a Mason, I got to go to, you know, Colonial Williamsburg and Alexandria Lodge, you know, and get to go see where these people, where these men were educated and, and go to see their libraries and, and became even more interested in the style of education because I just I want to be like them. Their achievements are just astounding. You look at what they what they did and you think about their wealth of knowledge and a true renaissance, a true renaissance yeah. man, you know? Yeah, I think that that's one of the most important things about the trivium, I think, is that it creates. Well, the trivium is really not it's not about a particular subject matter, right? It's about learning how to learn. Right. So somebody that that owns the trivium, like in their soul, can approach any new material and then and then make it their own. And so if you want to approach this sort of renaissance man, this well-rounded intellect, I think this is the this is the traditional way it was done. What we do now is not really education in most universities and most degree paths and certainly in public schools. It's not really education. It's training. It's, it's very specific skill based training. In most cases, it's business training. And it, and it and even then, it might not be very good for even business, but it doesn't, it doesn't equip people to deal with new material that's coming at them. And I think that now it's even more important because we're creating new knowledge at a more rapid pace than ever before. I'm very interested in knowledge as a concept, right? Uh, we talk in the knowledge management business, which my main business is in, we talk about the half-life of knowledge, which is, you know, how long does it take for half of everything we know to either be proven wrong or to become irrelevant? Like, the Earth's not flat, right? That ain't right. Well, so. wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's all these guys. <laughs> they're, they're all over, Scott. They say it's that it is. Well, that's for the next show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there are certain things, you know, like, like, the, like the, the four humors theory of, you know, we had phlegm and bile and you know this four humorous theories of biology is not not right you know we've found that that's not true and then another a, another example of something that's kind of lived out its half-life is like it's not important to know how to drive a standard shift transmission anymore so that's not wrong but it's not relevant anymore right the half-life of knowledge in 1965 was about eight, 15 to 18 years is our best guess of course this is hard to calculate now we believe us people that care and study this believe that it's about 18 months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you think about programming languages, how they come and go. Like a lot of our knowledge would be, you know, using Lotus 1, 2, 3, right? <laughs> like we don't do that anymore, right? So the knowledge that, that we developed as a, as a society around an obsolete software suite, well, that's no good anymore. So how, the trivium. How do you prepared, stay relevant? Well, there's another law, law that says that the older a piece of knowledge is, the more likely it will continue to be relevant. Ah. So, you know, if there's a book that's been around a thousand years and is still in print, it's likely to be in print another thousand years. I think it's Laffer's Law. So I think it's very important to be careful about what we learn so we don't spin our wheels. Like, I'm not real interested in learning HTML5 because HTML6 is coming. Right. But I am interested in learning how to learn because I think that's the biggest bang for my buck. And so, and the, and the fellow craft tells us to do that. It's not prescriptive about exactly what the things are that we should be learning. It's, t it's telling us how to learn. So you're kind of like, I think hearing all this, it, it really starts to make a lot of sense to me. You are an industrious Masonic bee, if I could call you that. Uh, and <laughs> okay. this is where I, I want to transition into what you've done. So the listeners out there, you've heard me mention this on the program for the last couple of weeks. And the more I learned about it, the more we had to get Scott on the program to talk a little about the importance of education 
especially talking about practical use of learning these things. But Scott, can you just tell us what you did? Because it's pretty astounding. Well, yeah, so I, I, I'm, a, I'm a member of a traditional observance lodge here in Tulsa as well. And we actually, in this traditional observance lodge, we actually are supposed to present a paper between each of the, to, to move on to your next degree. So there is a, there is a call in this TO lodge to engage with this work, right? To engage with the trivium, essentially, and to move the body of knowledge forward. And I actually wanted us to put together a study group and use like the Trivium Binder. I think you and I had talked about that. We did, or yeah. some other materials to actually pursue the darn thing. I mean, the fellow graph degree tells us to. The Master Lodge gets in front of us and charges us to pursue it. So I wanted to create a group to do that. And as we know, sometimes it's hard to do new things in Freemasonry. <laughs> I don't know if you know. Uh, yeah, maybe a little. So I ended up doing it in my home. I ended up uh, hand, you know, writing real live letters and folding them up and putting them in envelopes and mailing them to seven men. And I invited seven men because I have eight chairs at my dining room table and I was going to sit in one of them. And every one of them said yes. And they come to my house on the third Thursday of every month. And we have started working through the great books of the Western world as our vehicle for dealing with the trivium. And, uh, you know, we started with the Iliad and read the Odyssey and so on. And we're reading uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Oh, by the way, this is awesome. This month we're reading St. Thomas Aquinas' essays on the four cardinal virtues, temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. Hey, nice. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this, these great ideas and these classic works and the trivium are interwoven in Freemasonry inextricably, inextricably. And anyway, we started that group in my home. Uh, the group has grown. We now have a added people to the group, a few have fallen away. But I wanted to do it for some more people. A friend of mine uh, is Brett McKay, of Art of Manliness, fellow Freemason. Yeah, and yeah. He, yeah. And he comes to my home group, uh, and he said, hey, Hambrick, you know, you need to do this online. And, uh, you know, he has a service uh, called Str it's strenuouslife.co, uh, where he's trying to get you know men to actually take on these manly virtues in the meat world, in the real world, not just on his blog. Right. And... Um, He's like, you know, you should do something like that around the great books and the trivia. And I said, oh, Bradley, and I, I've, I don't need another job. And he said, oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. So we kicked it off January 8th. Uh, we kicked off intellectuallp.com or uh, onlinegreatbooks.com. And you can you go there. You pay 59 bucks a month. We ship the books directly to your house. We start you with a... Uh, Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book. We'll, more on that in a minute. And we send you email reading reminders, text message reading, remi uh, reading reminders. We have check-in tools and goal-setting tools on our website because we find that the accountability is the thing that people want. You know, m most of us want to be more well-read. You know, we all have a stack of books we wish we had read. Yep. And so we help we help people create that habit of close reading and difficult material for three hours a week. So the, the reading goals are centered around three hours of reading a week. And then once a month, uh, everyone attends a Socratic seminar that one of my one of my people hosts. So we have these trained hosts that play the part of Socrates, right? Socrates was, uh, well, I mean, we named the Socratic method after him, right? So right. He's, he's engaging all of our readers in dialectic and they discuss these books. And that's where they get the rhetoric part of the trivium is in that seminar. So, uh, uh, you know, we kicked it off on January 8th. We signed up 100 people for our beta test and turned off enrollment and uh, kind of ironed some bugs out. And then we opened it up again on May 1st and uh, going to run enrollment until May 14th and then close that second flight down. We'll probably open another one on July 1st. But uh, it's growing. It's growing. We've got, gosh, you know, we got a 100 people have read the Iliad, uh, how to read a book, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and... Um, now we have read Prometheus Bound and the or the uh, Oresteia, the three plays by Aeschylus about Agamemnon's family. And Just I, I mean, it's amazing. amazing. Yeah, like to think that you got a hundred people to read that willingly is. <laughs> I mean, these are books that I love. I have never made it all the way through all of them in succession or anything, but they're always books that I pull out and I will read chapters here and there or sections of. And I think that's really interesting that you can get the, the people together to 
not only just read it or, you know, whatever, even pick it up, but to read the whole thing and then participate. And you talked about having like goal setting methods, which is so imperative. There's so many apps out there today that like will stop us in the middle of our day. Hey, stop right now. It's time to have a one minute breathing meditation. And you're like, all right, sure. Or we have these, uh, tech wearables, you know, that remind us to sit up straight or things that we put on our beds to make sure that we're getting the right amount of sleep and, you know, all these things. So it would just make sense that if we're going to use this technology, like kind of in a physical way to reduce stress or to uh, increase health, why wouldn't we also do something similar to to do something like this? That's right. In fact, in fact... Uh, we have plans to actually develop an iPhone app or a smartphone app around this that will, well, you can tell it when you like to read. And so it'll tell you, hey, you're supposed to start reading in 15 minutes and your next reading is page you know, 67 through uh, 125. And then uh, it'll tell you when it's time to read and you can and you can tell it how long you want to read. And it'll put your phone on, it's going to put your phone on airplane mode for that time so you don't get interrupted. And it'll let you know when you're done and you can log your reading and tally up some points and all these little, you know, carrots to uh, help it, uh, give us an incentive to create that habit of close reading of this difficult material. Yeah, and, and all of our reading goals are centered around three hours a week for the average cat, right? So right. Someti- sometimes we read quite a bit, you know, if it's light. You know, uh, we'll read quite a bit. In other times, it's 20 pages a week. But that's okay. okay. Three hours a week is the Nielsen organization, the people that do all the you know, television ratings, say that uh, the American, the average American watches 27 hours of television a week. Oh, God. And I, I just want three hours of it. I just want three hours of that. Yeah, right. And, and that is it's so much to, to ask, right? Not not that we're forcing. I do this all the time. I have people out there who will say, RJ, what Masonic book should I read next? And I'm like, your monitor. Yeah, try that one first. <laughs> you know, here's the deal. In Illinois, after each degree, they get the candidates or, you know, the degree after the degree, they'll get a book. It's only like 20 pages. It's got history, some symbolism, your new rights as a fellow craft or your new rights as a master mason, these kind of things. And every candidate is supposed to get these things and they do, but nobody reads them. Right. And, and it just, it kills me. It rips my heart out going, you wanted this so bad that you were willing to just flip all the way to the back of the book and memorize the stuff, but you don't want it bad enough to know what you're talking about or what you're memorizing. And I think that's interesting that we have this, this dynamic of 26, 27 hours a week. I think I probably watch... Uh, if I'm being realistic, probably five to six hours of TV a week. And that's because I'm laying in my, like I go lay down, I turn on my TV, I watch one episode or two episodes of something, and then I fall asleep. It doesn't interfere with the rest of my day because I'm doing things, reading books or I'm, and I just wish more people would find that value. And I like that. I have to say, when you said that it turns your phone off or it goes to airplane mode, some people would be like, Oh, that's interfering with me and my life or whatever. But here's my thing. When the last iPhone update came out, right? And I start driving my car and it's, you're not going to receive notifications because you're driving. Oh, come on. Then I thought about it and I said, yeah, I text and drive way too much. That's probably a good idea. Get away, pull yourself away from something. And if people understand that this is a focus, not just on a program or reading, it's for you. It's a beneficial for you. Yeah, that's the thing. It's beneficial for you. Well, first, I want to I want to clarify our iPhone apps in development. If you sign up right now, you won't get it, but it's coming. It's coming. But yeah, no, we're doing this for you. Like in five years, you're definitely going to be five years older if you're lucky, right? <laughs> if, right. If you don't if you don't get in a car wreck, a car wreck because you were texting, but you're going to be five years older. Now, are you going to have at five years from now? Are you going to say, man, I binge watched Game of Thrones and this one and that one and whatever, or the time's going to pass, and you could have spent that on 7,000 pages of the greatest books that the world has ever created. You know, people will binge watch whatever show, and then there's always, there's actually, for us conscientious people, there's always some regret in that, you know? Mm-hmm. There, are, there always is. Like, I've watched all The Sopranos years ago, and while it's a pretty good show, you know, I could have done something better with that time. But I don't know anybody that has a single regret I've never met anybody that read Aristotle and said, gosh, that was a waste of time. Or maybe I could have done something better with my time. Yeah. I have never heard that. <laughs> Me neither. And so the time's going to pass. Three hours a week will get you through that. Yeah. The time will pass and you will be older if you're lucky. 
So what are you going to do with it? Uh, social media usage is about two hours a day for the average person. If you are a gamer, you're spending an hour and a half or hour and 45 minutes a day on that stuff. And uh, uh, gosh, you know, we just want 30 minutes a day. And it's, it's not a big deal. It really isn't. And I think it sounds amazing. So, Scott, we talked about time, right? That's one thing. If we can get people past the time to, it takes to read or whatever, Plato, Aristotle, these are not, are these books that are accessible to, as you said, you know, your average Joe spends three hours a week reading. Are these accessible to them intellectually? Yeah, they are. They are called, in some circles, you know, the great books of the Western world, the great books, right? And they're great because they have so many layers and that they are so accessible. I think, for example, the Iliad, I tell people this all the time, that, you know, if you're a 14-year-old kid and you read the Iliad, you're not going to get from it what a 70-year-old man would get. But it's one of the most excellent action adventures ever written. So if you're a 14-year-old kid, you're going to read the finest action adventure novel ever written. But if you're a 70-year-old, you're going to see questions about mortality, the role of man and the state, uh, adultery, fidelity, duty, honor, violence, the concept of the just war. Right. So no matter who you are, these books can meet you where you are. They're a lot like the degrees in that respect. Right. Like every time we see a degree, we get something different and more from it. And these books are the same way. So the entered apprentice takes away a very deep and interesting experience that first time they go through that blindfolded and they're overwhelmed. It's too much. And they'd almost drown in it, but they benefit. Right. And yeah. then every time we every time we take take that in again we learn more and we get more from it and these books are the exact same way they're just astounding they're just infinitely uh, discussable and and the, and then the other thing is is these these books were so good and so important that they passed through the filter of manual labor like most of these are before the gutenberg press you know and somebody had to kill a hundred sheep and skin them and make parchment and then copy those things by hand right so so it had to be good enough for you to spend 190 hours or so. I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't know, hundreds of hours to copy that book so your grandkid could have it. Yeah, and, in and, some <laughs> case, and in some cases, these books would get you killed, and they would hide them under penalty of death so their grandkids could have it, and ultimately so you could have it. And if you don't pick it up, you've betrayed those people. It's an interesting way to put it. And, you know, it's the respect of the, the thoughts of the authors and the people who have protected the works for hundreds and hundreds of years in cases of thousands. Our Masonic tradition is the same way, right? Like there were times when it was not healthy <laughs> right. to be a Mason in certain places, right? And we passed that, that tradition down. And these books are the same way. If you don't pick it up, I mean, you're breaking the thread, right? And, and one of the reasons I started this project is because I'm desperately afraid that we're one EMP or one electromagnetic pulse away from losing civilization, you know? It doesn't and take much, man. If you do the research nope. on what that is, I mean, it's kind of scary to think about how little it would take. Yep. It's, it's, it's awful. And so, you know, when we read Plato at uh, onlinegreatbooks.com, I sent everybody the Hackett hardback edition, you know, complete Plato. And it's 54 bucks. I only charge fifty nine dollars a month. I, I lose my butt that month, you know. Right. But I want. I'm like the Gideons. I want every house in America to have <laughs> an acid free copy of the complete works of Plato. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. It's pretty awesome. We get, we've got to keep the lights on. I'm worried about it. And you know, and free, and I think Freemasonry has been a repository of ideas and liberal thought uh, for hundreds of years. And this is—I mean, we don't have a charge that I'm aware of anyway in our ritual that charges us with you know keeping the 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 capital T truths for everyone forever. But I think that's one of our jobs. Interesting that you put it that way, but it certainly seems that the Masonic fraternity, you know, the deeper you get when you read some of the more interesting texts, you know, uh, Wilmshurst, Pottinger, Plumer, uh, even some Claudi, like we, we read some of that stuff. God, and, God you're a nerd. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, so we read those texts and there are really interesting underlying themes that alluding, I mean, in some cases, uh, Pottinger and, and Wilmshurst will allude to truths, whereas Plumer just comes right out and says things, and it might be a little bit inflammatory to us if we're in the opposite mindset. But I mean, these books are to sit down and to read them and pull like these truths, these these 
you know, we used to talk about prima facie and, and absolute truth, but to pull out these things that are seemingly absolute to the human mind, I mean, we'll never really know because we're flawed humans, but these are, these are words and ideas that have passed through thousands of years. You know, when I think of, when I think of Freemasonry, one of the, one of the th images that comes to me is that it's this child of the enlightenment, you know, and that, that the, the liberal man was really born of Freemasonry. I think we have a lot to do with, I think Freemasonry has a lot to do with the, the, the rise of liberal democracy and republicanism, right? And in all of that, all of that is born of, of these books. And I love the books, the sense of connectedness that I get with um, the people that came before us is, um, is so gratifying to me. You know, my grandparents are all gone. And in the men that brought me up in masonry, they're all gone, you know, and uh, I, you know, I, I get that connection. I get that connection to our past and the people that have got me where I am nowadays to a great degree through these books because darn it, you know. I'm starting to turn it. I'm starting to be one of those older guys. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. As, as we get older, you, you talked about, we, we sit down and we'll read a book at one stage in our life and we read it again later and it means something completely different. And yeah. this is like the measure of time. Our understanding has come millions of miles uh, from, well, both physically and literally millions of miles from where we were when we first hear a story of something, we pick up new nuances. And like you said, it's so important because when we think about the connectedness of generations past, people who read those books too, and it's almost like we're, in one sense, I think about we're reading the literal thoughts of somebody who lived thousands of years ago or hundreds of years ago. And in those aspects, how intimate that is. And the other aspect is knowing that also some relative or compatriot of mine has also read those same words. The immortal Washington we talk about, he, he wasn't as well read as, as Jefferson, you know, um, but, but you know, these, these guys, th these guys spent time with these books, you know, and, and uh, I want to be like them. So it's, I got to go spend time with them too, darn it. But I hope everybody, I hope everybody listening takes this up. You don't have to do it with me at onlinegreatbooks.com. There is an, uh, there's a great books foundation. You can go get that book, How to Read a Book, um, and it tells you how to how to do close reading of this difficult material. It has a fantastic reading list in the back of it that's very similar to the one we use. Ours is mostly stolen from them. And start a group in your lodge or start a group in your home. You know what I'm doing is weak compared to an in person uh, in person group. <laughs> uh, there's something about sitting around a round table and facing these other people and engaging a dialectic that's uh, that's that can't be replicated, you know, with uh, an online meeting like we do. I think that's uh, so awesome that, that you're doing this. And I want to ask, so if they want to do this, if they want to check it out, what's the website? Where do they go? Yeah, so go to onlinegreatbooks.com and you go sign up there. And if you use the promo code WCY, right? Yes, sir. Uh, they'll get 25% off their first three months. And, and they also help support your show because we've got a little advertising arrangement uh, with you. So, uh, yeah, support uh, Wins Came You podcast and uh, broaden your mind. We're supposed to do that. We all took, well, I don't know. We, could, we probably have some uh, non-Masons listening, but all of us uh, Masons that are listening uh, took an obligation and were charged to do this work. So you better do it. <laughs> Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So there you have it, everybody. Like I said, I've been pushing this for a lot couple weeks, I do want to let everybody know who's listening. At the time I'm recording this, there are 12 days and four hours left mm. of enrollment. So when this show goes live on Sunday, we're going to be at like eight or nine days left. Yeah. So I want everybody out there to at least head on over there, check out. There's a video Scott's got up on the website. And also uh, at the top of their website, we'll put a link in the show notes to all this, but he's got a, uh, a new podcast, Inter Intellectual Linear Progression Talks. And they talk about yeah. Homer's Iliad. And it's, I think, about 35, almost 40 minutes or so episode. Uh, but it's really good. It's riveting. It's cool stuff, man. <laughs> like if you if you really value your mind and thinking and thought, and you you think you're cognitive of a person, I think you owe it to yourself to at least check out the podcast, check out the website. And, and like Scott said, even if you don't do this program, pick up those books and check some stuff out. So uh, Scott, I, I want to thank you so much for spending some time. I know you're a super busy guy and uh, it's not always easy to find time in the evenings when we have kids and family to uh, come on a show and talk about some nerdy stuff 
So hey, I, I want to thank it's a delight. Hey, thanks. Thank you for doing this podcast. You know, we've got to find a way to keep the light on, right? To keep to keep the thread from being broken. And this podcast is a is a big part of that. You know, we uh, in a lot of in a lot of places these lodges are frankly they're getting weaker, right? The conversation that we used to have, at the, you know, after and before lodge is uh, is waning, and uh, you're keeping that conversation alive here. So that is that is fantastic, and thanks for thanks for sweating and bleeding on it and get making it happen. Hey, you too, man. Yeah, we got to put it to work in the quarry. So thank Good you deal. very much. Thanks. All right, I hope you enjoyed that interview. Again, please head on over to wcypodcast.com, hover over the support the show links, check out the link for the Great Books program, use the promo code WCY at checkout. You're going to get 25% off for your first three months of the program. This is something that truly benefits us and our minds. And like Scott said, if you don't want to use this program, then at least check out the program and check out these great books. Think about that, the half-life of information. So in the 60s, 18 years information was relevant. Today, it's 18 months. But also, the longer something has been in print, the more it is likely to be relevant. And these books are thousands of years old. So that should tell you they're going to be relevant for at least the next 500 to 1,000 years. Check them out. Additionally, under the support of the show, I would like to ask you to please make a direct donation or go to our limited edition shop. Either one, you make a donation back to the show by picking up a lapel pin, or perhaps you sign up to be a contributor, a fellow, or a producer of the program. All that money goes right back into the production of this program, which is listener-supported education made by you for every Mason out there. And we have a lot of people, you guys, that are benefiting from the show who aren't Masons yet. We've got countless people who have written this show to say, this show, I started listening to it months before I became an entered apprentice or months before I decided to turn in that petition. And this was the deciding factor. So that's all thanks to not just this show. It's thanks to all of you who make the show possible. So I want to thank all of you for doing that. In addition, we have the Banker's Best Agreement. So we have a great relationship with Banker's Best Beard and Skin Care by Levi Banker, a brother out of the St. Louis area. Uh, you may have seen pictures of he and I at the St. Louis reunion just a couple weeks ago. Check out his products by heading on over to buybankersbest.com and you can check out that stuff there. Use the promo code BBWCY357 at checkout and you'll get a really good percentage off there. Uh, but if you go to our website and click through the links, uh, we've got some exclusive uh, arrangements there. So check that out as well. And last but not least, we have On It Labs. So we finally got our promo code back for whatever reason. They took it off for a little while. But now if you go to support the show, get on it, Click through our links to Alpha Brain or Hemp Force Protein or anything like that, and you'll actually get 10% off your order by using our promo code. And a little bit of that money that you spent comes right back to the show. It doesn't cost you a penny more than if you went direct to them, but uh, they help out the show a little bit of a kickback there later on. Thanks to everybody who goes out of the way to support this program. I really hope you enjoy. We'll talk to you all next week where I've got a great interview with Frater O and George R. Adams, past grandmaster and 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite, talking about truth. George R. Adams. George blows me away, blows Frater away when we talk about the concept of truth, what it is, and how it's applied today. So that's it for this week. Thanks again for listening. And uh, please check out the new book. It's Business Time on Amazon. It's on our website, wcypodcast.com. I'll talk to you guys all next week. Until then, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, brother, Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.